This summer, we started a journey with Humanitarian Toolbox to build an application for disaster preparedness. What we do with Humanitarian Toolbox is we focus on how can we get volunteers involved and, and not just have them do manual labor tasks, but as somebody who has technical skills, there's more you can do, there's more impact you can have. What we're trying to do from a preparedness aspect is we're trying to get smoke detectors into people's homes you know, who don't have them, and that's where this kind of app can come in to make getting this program working much more, more effectively. The reality is you're gonna spend three days dedicating your time working on an application, something that's gonna be carried forward by others. So this is your choice to be here and spend that time, so thank you. We're really proud of the work we've been able to do with 15 developers over the last three days, but this is only the beginning. This is already, this is a project for the Red Cross. Now we had a few codeathons since July and got you know, quite a bit of code written. That led to a whole new rack of work items, lots of little details. And so the work items went from a few prototype features to this larger block of what's the things we must have to actually run the field trial. There was an opportunity to get a really amazing group of people together and push through to the final details so that we can put this project in the field. It's really exciting to see all of these volunteers come together with just this very unique skill set. And this sort of a, a code -thon is really incredible and it's really neat to see all this expertise in one room. The only way for me to volunteer and help in any kind of humanitarian effort has been, okay, well, put down Visual Studio, put down Git, put down anything that you know about working um, in your craft and go pick up power tools. And I'm like, no, you, you don't have enough band-aids for me to build a house for someone. This is just a fantastic opportunity, A, to work with some great people, and B, to use our skills as software developers to actually build some software that can help people. This is the reality of it, right? Software is a superpower, and getting all those superheroes to fly in the same direction is a trick. Coordinating a project can be quite difficult. Let's see how they managed everything in GitHub. So, uh, Bill. Hey, Seth, how we doing? Great, tell us what you're doing on the project, bud. Well, I've been incredibly busy today. <laughs> I, so, I saw. You know, you've been talking to everybody here, and I was just to keep, so the way we're managing the project and managing reviews is we're using the GitHub flow model. Sure. So basically, anybody who's working on a task, they fork our repo, so they take our GitHub repo, fork it into their own account, okay? Once it's in their own account, they bring it down to their desktop, they do all the work in Visual Studio, all the things that happen there, submit it into their copy of the already repo. Okay. And then when they say they're done, they submit a pull request. I see. And then one of the key committers, Tony or I, or we've now added James as a member of the commit team, can go through and look through each one of these. Awesome. So I just want to show you just today's activity. Okay, so here's one page. That's all today. Wow. Okay, we got more. This is page two. We're still on today, November 7th. We're rolling down here. We've got all these merges. And when we get down here into, we see the first ones that we did this morning, the third page down in our commit log, you know, for wow. just today, you know, and yesterday we were working quite a bit and there's another several pages there for yesterday, okay? So we've got a so lot of work happening this stuff weekend. Going on. Now, the way we do this, here's basically the process that goes through. So I've got three open poll requests right now, okay? And here's where they're sitting here. You know, this is going to be fun. I get to review Rocky Lotka's code. Okay, so we get <laughs> it, to say, awesome. dude, did you do it right? Yeah, of course Okay, and there's a comment here. So we'll look at this one, and you can see this one's green, and I'll explain where we're going there. So when I look at his pull request, you know, I can see what he's changed. So he's added a couple tests here. You can see Dave Paquette, one of the people already is um, reviewing Sign. this. And there's the emoji here. This is the ship it emoji. <laughs> so. In this case, I don't have to review Rocky's code. All right, Dave already did. He said, this is great, this is wonderful. This next block here says we have some checks that we do to make sure a pull request is ready and doesn't break the build, okay? So the first one here, the check that we have, and this is an app fair one, so we're doing a continuous integration of every pull request mm -hmm. using app fair. So what happens is when somebody submits a pull request, this software in the cloud builds it, runs all the tests, and then says, okay, it's good, okay? And then it also checks to make sure that it's up to date with the base branch, so I don't have to do any manual merging. I see. Which would be the other reason we pull it back. So we got new tests, we've got this happening, and now I'm gonna do the merge, great. Add and improve some tests, okay? Confirm the merge, great, and now it's in place. 
Okay, so that's one more thing that just got done. Now, the other thing that I should probably show, the way we're tracking this, and especially if anybody, even after this goes live and you're watching, we're looking at, we basically track everything as issues. So you go under the issues, and we take milestones here that we're trying to track. This is what we're trying to finish today and tomorrow. And you can see these are the tasks that were assigned to this milestone. And when we finish, we're gonna take, set a new milestone, basically a new scrum, and say, let's try to get as many as we can done. By building this in ASP.NET 5, it gives a chance for developers to learn some new skills. You know, you may not get to use the latest bits in your day job. Come join us and, and see what they do. And so there's there's a little bit of a learning curve, but it's interesting in how now we have the ability to do certain things that sort of speed up the development process, even though you know there are some struggles when you're working with a beta version. But overall, it's interesting how you can pull in all of your assets that you need in new ways, you know, that's more integrated using Grunt, Gulp, things like that, where you had to really work toward that in previous versions. Now it's all part of it, you know, it makes it a lot easier. Some of these developers were using some really cool techniques. Let's look at a pattern that one of them was using in this project. All right, so why don't you tell us now, because we've talked about all this great stuff, who are you, dude, and what do you do? Uh, you know, I'm just a dude who works out of his basement in Brandon, Manitoba, so. This is good stuff, I mean, <laughs> seriously. Um, my name's James Chambers. I'm an ASP.NET IIS MVP. Um, I'm, I've been a four-time awardee, and I'm just really loving the new stuff in Azure and on ASP.NET vNext, ASP.NET 5, I guess we're right. called now. Um, and so, yeah, I blog in this space, I'm working in this space, and this opportunity to work with the Already Crew is just awesome. Like, to take our craft and to apply it to something that's, like, for the greater good is just really cool. What we wanted to do was to basically, you know, take the workload that was happening in the website itself okay. and move it off into the cloud. We Let's let the website keep moving as quickly as possible, but the long running tasks, the IO, the email sending, the calling the REST APIs out to send SMS messages, uh -huh. we want to make sure that that's not tying up the tasks on the website proper. Uh, I see. We knew up this command, we put in all of the details that we need to, we post it onto a queue, and then we've got a job that's running in the back end, a web job, okay. that's just part of our Azure website. Got it. Um, and it runs in the back end, and when it's triggered automatically when a new entry goes into the queue. Why don't that, you explain a little bit what a queue is? Sure. This, so the storage queue uh, is one of the uh, features of Azure, and it allows us just to post a message. And in my case, all I'm doing is taking that command that I've got. I use json.net to serialize it as a sure. JSON document. We pitch it up just as a string, so it's super easy. Uh, and then on the on the other side of it, when that queue is actually when we want to start processing the queue, mm -hmm. um, you know, and back to what a queue actually is, it's it's just a it's just that it's just you know yeah. the, the way that we think about it. You stand in line for something, and then eventually you get to the front of the line. Got so it. the queue works that way as well. And the storage queue, there's some cool things about it, like it's going to keep retrying for us if there's failures mm -hmm. and everything. Rather than writing all of that logic inside of our app, we just install the Azure SDK, throw our message onto the bus, and then uh, we wait for it to be triggered in our web job. And that's on a completely different process. Awesome. Well, let's let's take a look at it. Yeah, absolutely. One of the scenarios for notifications that we want to use is when we have an activity that's set up and there's all these tasks that need to be completed, we're going to assign volunteers uh, these tasks. So okay. we want them to be notified. You know, you signed up to help on this project. Here's an opportunity for you to help. This matches your skill set. We'd like you to try this out. Oh, that's awesome. Well, let's look at the code of uh, how you can do that. Absolutely. So um, in the code itself here, we basically, we get a list of all the updates that are coming in. We have, you know, we just new up a couple of lists. We add anything that had been changed from the view model that's posted back into our controller action here. And then very easily, we just set up a view model for this command and we send it off to the bus. And that's that's all that's needed to make that happen. Maybe you can help educate me. Are you guys using the CQRS type pattern? Command and query, but we're not doing full blown event sourcing. Got it. Yeah. Got it. Okay. So now that's I've got my bus that gets passed in via DI. I've got my controller here that does the interesting awesome. bits of building up my model. I send it off to the bus, and then without waiting for any crazy processing to actually happen, yeah. I get to just resume rendering the website. Awesome. Well, let's take a look at the one for sending messages. It looks like it's right there. Yeah, this is it right here. This is the command, and you can see it's it's pretty straightforward. What we're doing is we've got a single command that lets any caller choose to send out 
the SMS messages, the email messages, or both. So you build up that body of SMS recipients, you build up the body of email recipients, and when you pass that in, if there's anything in that collection, it's gonna loop over them and then queue the messages. The SMSs have a recipient and a message, the email recipients have an email and a subject, and a subject as well. And we're actually, because we're using SendGrid, we're actually gonna be able to use templates as well, so all the emails that go out are gonna look like super, like. Awesome. Yeah, so they're, gonna, gonna, they're gonna look tight. That's cool. Okay. Yeah. Can we see where the event happens when you actually get the queue, the message in the queue, and then it notifies somebody that it gets a message? Right, and th this is the super simple part. Um, so down here, we've got a web job called Notification Processor. Mm -hmm. And you configure it to deploy side by side with your web app. Right. When you, actually the tooling in Visual Studio 2015 now supports, you can like right click and add a web job to this oh, website deployment. Oh, that's deployment. so much nicer than it used to be. Let's look at the job, getting the stuff off the... Right, so to start up the job, what we do, in my case, I'm using user secrets. Yep. So the Azure storage connection string is stored in my user secrets, and this is, or in this case, an environment variable, I apologize, mm -hmm. but that's the pattern that, you know, that pattern that we're doing. Got it. And it looks like the job host is the actual thing that's going to be running this, this, all this stuff. That's right. So we do we do run and block. And then the way the SDK works is it scans for anything that looks like something that is part of the Azure SDK. Right, so see. I've got this functions.cs and I've got a process SMS queue message. It's got a queue trigger, a property attribute on it. Mm -hmm. And when when this compiles, when this builds, when this runs, it, it dives in and basically pulls these functions out and says, this is something that we're gonna to use to participate in that job host. Okay, so let's look at the queue trigger attribute that's happening on this function. Anytime something goes into that queue, execute this function. Exactly. Okay, got it. Yeah, and then so, you know, we've, we know that it's that JSON object that we had serialized previously. Sure. So we deserialize it back out. We've got a shared type with a common core sure, sure, library sure. or whatever. So we deserialize that back out. We read from our environment variables to pull out things like our Twilio ID and our token, the phone number that we're sending from. And then the rest of it is send the two. We got the message that we've got. We create an instance of the Twilio REST client. This is all like code that you can just pull right off yeah, of there. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and then we just uh, send it out. If there's an exception, if there's something goes wrong with sending it via Twilio, they populate this REST exception object. So if that's not null and there's a message in there, then we know something went wrong and we just log it out. Man, you're going full Elvis operator and string interpolation. I know, I love it. Hey, it's, it's great. great, C stuff. sharp six. Yeah. Okay. Well, thanks so much for spending time with us, bud. Yeah, absolutely. All right, back to work. Sounds good. All right, thanks. <laughs> We've got this process of, of wanting to make the website as responsive as possible, but we don't want to have to, we want to make sure that there's guaranteed delivery on things. Rather than writing a whole complex set of code that, that we need to in order to ensure delivery, we've got automatic retries in a storage queue out in Azure. We can ship a command up there and wait for a queue processor to pick it up and then deliver emails and deliver SMS via other cloud services that are connected uh, to our to our Azure project, and it, things like that just weren't even possible five years ago. So it's very interesting how they've sort of structured this into these lots of little decoupled pieces that uh, we probably should have more tests for, but you always want more tests in a project like this. I'm here with Rocky. Why don't you introduce yourself and tell us what you've been working on, bud? Sure. I'm Rocky Lopka. I'm the CTO at Magenic, and uh, here adding some tests to the uh, Toolbox project. So that sounds like super easy, but when you're looking at adding tests to a project that's already existing, sometimes that requires a little retooling. Did you did you have any of that happen? Oh yeah, uh, testing's never actually easy. <laughs> no, I know, I'm just saying it sounds easy. <laughs> but if you go to your manager and you're like, hey, we're gonna add some tests, they're like, oh, that's super easy. But that's not what it is, right? No, in, in fact, there's uh, you know, a lot of, uh, uh, existing code, so we've got to figure out what the code is doing and then, uh, in some cases, figure out ways to uh, be able to generate uh, sample data or, or known data sets and, mm -hmm. and uh, run through the code. And so we've had to um, change a, a few things here and there. Luckily, I've uh, only found one real bug so far today, so that's, that's encouraging. That's good. All right, well, let's take a look at what you've done and see if we can find any of that. Sure. So. Really, the uh, project had very limited testing uh, to start with, but then I've added some new ones here. So, for example, we've got a test that is running through the idea of uh, can we get activity detail? Uh -huh. And uh, um, on the surface, you'd say, well, that's that's easy, right? If we look down here, the actual tests are not that hard. We uh, basically create a query uh, and then call the handler. And then in this case, I expect not to get anything back. So I'm saying, well, is it, you know, a null? Um, so that, that was the easy part. But then when you start saying, well, what about the test for something that does exist? 
say, well, we do expect to get something back. Mm -hmm. Okay, fair enough. Then there's all this code here because we have to actually have something to get back. Right. And you know, days gone by, um, and I'm sure a lot of people maybe still do this, we'd set up a, a test database and have some sort of script every time you run your tests, mm -hmm. it would reinitialize the data, the actual database. Mm -hmm. and, and you know, um, why well, I remember those days. No, uh, it was a horrible like time. Yeah, right? it was a nightmare. <laughs> uh, so in this case, what we've got is uh, we're using Entity Framework with uh, uh, an in-memory database model. I see. And uh, um, so in fact, if I go up one level uh, higher, um, and, and here's one of the areas where we started refactoring some of this, is we've got a base class for the tests that at least sets up some of the uh, base configuration information, and, and in this case in particular, is setting up our entity framework, it creates essentially an empty um, in-memory database. In -memory database. And all of this is using dependency injection to pull the appropriate resources. Sure just like the app itself does. So let's talk um, a little bit about the tooling and how the tooling is helping you with unit tests. Is the tooling doing anything for you when it comes to unit tests? Well, the tooling is fairly nice. You know, Built into Visual Studio is this idea of the test explorer and, mm -hmm. and uh, test runner. So I'm able to just run up here and say, oh, I'd like to you know, run all of my tests. Um, it'll do a quick build. And uh, if we go back to the test explorer, now we'll see um, right across here the bar. Mm -hmm. um, I've got one failing test, which I know I'm working on that now. Oh, awesome. Um, so I expect that to be failing. I'm not done with it. Cool. So in your experience, and you've been doing this for a long time, code coverage, what do you feel sort of like a good sort of smell for how much should I be testing? I really think it's, it's difficult to narrow down on a specific percentage. Sure. Um, certainly I've worked or, or interacted with places that are like, oh, we want 100%. And I don't think that's um, cost effective, right? Useful, I mean, yeah. yeah. If if you can even achieve it, you're spending way more money than you should be, right? Um, but yeah, twenty percent is typically bad, pretty, pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. So you probably want somewhere, you know, well north of fifty percent. Um, but I also think that you have to look at what you're testing because there's um, uh, code that's a lot more complex or, right. or a lot more on the critical path, and then there's code that's that's arguably less important. So what do you have? What kind of work do you have? ahead of you? Uh, well, boy, we're just really getting started on this testing. Um, so we're, you know, I've got to flesh out some of the tests that are here, and, and now that we've got a model, I think it'll be easier um, maybe to get more people involved in writing some more tests on, on more handlers. Well, awesome. Well, I'll let you get to work, bud. Great, thanks. All right, thanks, bud. So one of the biggest challenges we had today is we literally couldn't have people test. We had the code, it seemed to be working on my machine, it always works on my machine, on their machine, someone's machine, and we finally figured out how to get that thing deployed so the testers weren't testing code that was a week or two old. And getting that was a huge moment because it basically doubled the amount of manpower that we had working today. We're trying to pull in a bunch of different technologies, and so we had lots of different ways it just wasn't working. We tried looking at uh, splitting up the build, we tried deploying instead of automatically doing it manually. We tried a lot of different options. What we finally found is that we had to kind of break it down into separate pieces. So for deployment, we focused on how do we deploy it manually versus get automated stuff from continuous deployment. And then we were able to figure out what the actual issue was there and solve that. What we did is we took the code and manually deployed it. So I was kind of playing the role of the continuous deployment mechanism. And we figured out that what was happening is it was getting there, we're running into an error, but we weren't seeing an error screen. So we went in, we made some changes to the Azure configuration. We're actually able to see some of the logs behind the scenes of stuff we weren't seeing through the web page. All right, Bill, so, so it looks like you got some cool stuff to show us. Right, so once again, we, we talked earlier, we were having trouble with our deployment scripts and with some help from David Fowler, actually, who wrote some of the build engine. He's coming in and helping us get this through. So here's the, how the process works when it's supposed to work. Okay, so now, now, so now let, me, let me see if we got this right. So now you were having some build problems before, right. we saw that. So now you were able to resolve that with some help. Right. And now we're gonna see how this whole process okay, works. Okay, so I've got pull requests. You mm -hmm. can see the one here with the yellow. That says it's it's building, All right? When I click into it, and that page was a little bit, a little bit old. You can see we come down here and you can see now it says, again, all checks have passed, up to date with the base branch. Right. Before we got on camera, I reviewed all the code. Normally I do that at this stage. Sure. So I go ahead and just merge this, and I confirm the merge, okay? And now if I switch over to this other window, I'm showing our deployments. Mm -hmm. And what we should see here really shortly is, now you can see it's grabbing it, there it's it fetching is. the changes. 
It's going to run the build in the cloud. It's going to deploy those bits. Sure. And we'll have new bits on the site. That's awesome. Okay. So, what was the challenge? What was going on in the background that was so, causing this issue? So, what was going on is we're running. In order to get our web jobs running, we're trying to build both XProj and CSProj. Which are which are not necessarily compatible. We no, don't even know if they are. So what we needed was one of the guys from the build team, David Fowler, just was looking at our deployment script and pointing out where, oh yeah, you gotta do this when you're in this situation, you gotta do this on this deploy, and, and there you go. Well that's super handy. It is. It was great to get the, the support we've gotten as we're trying to use some of the latest and greatest and even not yet released stuff has been really super. So can you get into sort of the details while this is still baking of what sort of things you had to change? There were a couple different ones. And I'm gonna end up writing a blog post about this oh, probably cool. by the time you Watch get for it, it yeah. there. So when you go to say, please generate the deployment script for me, and there's a way in Kadoo and you can use the Azure, um, the Azure tools that get installed via NuGet, mm -hmm. and it'll say, okay, please generate the script that, the default script that actually runs on the site. Mm -hmm. So then we get that, and I was starting to modify it. Well, that default script assumes that your solution file is in the root of your repo. Okay, well, at our repository, it's one directory down. I see. So I had to modify that whole default script. Okay. Okay. You can configure that so it knows and runs correctly. Sure. But you, we just had to change that, um, that bit in the configuration. And then it was trying to get everything to build in the right order. And once we started building, then it was primarily we had to make some change to point for the CS projects to point to the V2 NuGet feed. Mm -hmm. And once we got that going, then the same command we were running that I showed you earlier, so reviewing the pull request, that's now running exactly the same order, exact same commands up in Kadoo, up in Azure, to deploy from our main repo. Awesome, so let's yeah. watch this. How long does this usually take to build? Probably more time than we really want to sit and watch this. All right, well, but let's... But it can take as much as about eight or nine minutes. Okay. Because well... it has to do all that and install the runtime and everything. Well, cool. And then what would happen is this deploying one then would suddenly become that active deployment, just as you see the next one down. Mm -hmm. And what we'll see when it's done is once it's active, I can go and I can look at everything and see about how long it takes. And you can see it takes, that one took about four minutes. Oh, that's not bad. There we go. And see? And now we have new bits. So if I flip back over to this other browser here, if I go to this page right here and I refresh, I'll be refreshed and running the new bits. This is awesome. So you're able to now sort of, as things get checked into whatever release or development right. branch you have, it'll just pull it right in, run the build. But Get it going. This push, this last few weeks from culminating this weekend, is us getting to the minimal viable product. All the bits that we can actually go take it into the field. And I'm very cognizant of the fact that that's the point where we find out if we actually have a clue. Like, have we built the right things? Can people who are not computer people use this app and actually get some results from it? All right, so I'm here with Tony and Sarah, and we're gonna sort of get a demo of what you guys have been able to accomplish in the last couple of days. Yeah. So why don't we get started? Last couple of days, in the last couple of months, we've pulled together a whole bunch of code. So we're gonna look at it from two point of views. The first one is from the technology we have for individual volunteers or users who come. And so you'll be able to search with this giant search magnet there, or otherwise what you can do is you can um, see the campaigns. All of the organizations who are on the, on the application can just list whatever preparedness campaigns that they've got going on anywhere in the country. That's pretty cool. I mean, you get it in there, it seems like it's pretty easy to just get in there and do it. Yep, and so I can look in a campaign, I can find out what are some of the activities available. So I can go from I want to do something to I actually want to start to volunteer for a particular task. So do you have to be logged in to do this part? Nope, all of this is visible from the public side. We want it to be as easy to get to, and then it's not until you volunteer that you have to start giving information and logging in. So that would be the site where you would be able to see exactly what types of events and activities are going on in your own neighborhood, basically. Cool. Yeah. So for example, here I can find out that maybe in a particular neighborhood there's a fire prevention day and I can go ahead and click volunteer. It'll ask me some for information, some skills I might have, and then connect me up to somebody like Sarah who might actually assign me to a task. So what's gonna happen after they volunteer? You'd get this feedback and what would you do from there? Yeah, so I would see a list of all of the people who want to volunteer for a certain task or a certain activity, and then I would look at all of the tasks that we need to accomplish during that activity, and I would start to assign people tasks based on all of their various skill sets. Awesome. And we're not quite fully there, but I can actually show you what she's talking about. So from an admin point of view, I can go and look at a campaign. So Sarah would go in, look at a campaign, and find out, okay, for this particular activity, I've got, obviously, this is sample data, but I've got some users here who have signed up to volunteer. I've got a set of tasks, and then she can actually go in here and start to match up 
different volunteers to different tasks. Now we don't have it done today, but what we're gonna do is be able to show past history, so it'll help her pick the best volunteer for a task, as well as matching up skills. Maybe I need people who are carpenters or electrical for this task, and I can find out are there people who are volunteers who have that skill set. Can you give us a sense for how long this would have taken before something like this? Not really. <laughs> it's, it, it takes weeks to, I mean, we're basically doing call downs. So we've got all of our list of volunteers and we're doing call downs. Um, we're putting word out there for what we call event-based volunteers, who are just spontaneous volunteers who want to get involved. But then you've got to call them, you've got to see what their comfort level is, how long they're able to participate in the event. And it just, it takes a long time. So having, having volunteers proactively kind of step up and then to already know what they're uh, comfortable doing is going to make that, that process a lot smoother. I mean, you literally don't have to call anybody. Well, you're still going to make some calls, but sure. this is going to sort of alleviate a lot of that pressure. Oh, absolutely. And it's something we were talking about earlier, which I'm really excited about at the at the task level, uh, just exporting that out as work assignments, being able to get just a nice report of, look, these are all the people who are going to do that task for that day, and here's all their contact information, and have that for the people who are managing the event. That's fantastic. And our motivation in building this is the less she can spend time having to do this work, then the more time she's actually spending doing good and, yeah. and helping out in the community. Yeah. So we talked about skills. So one of the other capabilities we have here is they can create their own sort of taxonomy of skills. We've obviously got some sample data here, but you can go in and you can specify carpenter skills, electrical skills, um, maybe the ability to do heavy lifting or particular certifications, mm -hmm. all those things that you'd have to gather from somebody so you can have a list that they can supply to you, you can also request, and you can do that matching as you assign somebody to a task. So traditionally, there'd probably be like some huge Excel spreadsheet when you're doing call downs that someone's just literally filling out or something like that. Yeah, if we're lucky, if we even have that formalized uh, information, mostly it's a project manager just kind of keeping it on their head and they, they sort of have the lay of the land and person X is going to do this and person Y is going to do that and just hope for the best on the day of. So one of the things here that's less about an individual organization, but we also have the ability to have multiple organizations. Ultimately, this is multi-tenant, if you will, from a technical point of view, because the goal is for a community, say Chicago, to be able to see everybody who's active doing something in a preparedness campaign so that I as an individual can go to a campaign and I can not only volunteer, but eventually there'll be the ability for me to go in here and say, you know what, I actually would like the, to receive the benefit of that. I'd like a smoke detector so you can kind of sign up to be part of that, which helps direct them as to who to help first. Awesome. And we're hoping over time we'll be able to pull data out of this so that we can also show sort of overall indexes of res uh, resilience and reliability and what people are able to do in their own communities. And also help you give the data to know when you're going out and doing something in a large community, where do you go first? Yeah. What's going to have the sort of bang for the buck, if you will. Awesome. You know, the thing that's interesting about a project like this is it becomes people's hobby. You know, this is uh, what people want to work on. Like you could go bowling on Wednesdays, but instead you pick up a work item for already and help move it along. So I love working on this project because I feel like I'm making a difference. And that's what it, that's the core of what matters to me. So I, the things I do on a day-to-day -day basis, I want to improve someone's life. So after several weeks of work leading up to the Codathon and a really amazing three days, we're now ready with uh, what we call a minimal viable product. All of the basic pieces to now take this into the field. We want to just build the least necessary to truly try because we know as soon as it hits the field, it's going to be different. They're going to learn things about the way it works. They're going to be making some changes. So we got there. We've got those pieces together. We're just getting, waiting now to get it out in the field. And we're hoping by the end of November, we'll be ready with a new set of requirements to go for it. It's been three days and we're really proud of the work we've been able to accomplish. There's still a lot more to be done. Go to Humanitarian Toolbox to see how you can help make it even better.